My name is Lily Serafin. I was born on March 21st, 1982 in Tehran. My mother and I left Iran in April of 1985. My mom knew not a word of English nor a single soul <laughs> when we moved to LA. And within a week, we had an apartment. Uh, she had gotten her driver's license. She'd bought a used car and she um, got a job as a bank teller. Then when I was about seven, my mom thought that things had settled down. She wanted to resume her life in Iran. Um, it was near the end of the war. And so we returned in uh, around 1989. And that's when my mom realized that those years that we'd spent in the United States were, um, you know, they were quite formative for me. It allowed her to compare and contrast and see the life that she was going to be able to offer me in Iran versus the life that we had led in California. And even though it came with so many challenges, you know, just like any immigrant experience, I think after a few months, we returned to California this time to stay. And so that's really when our life as Americans took hold. Within a few months, she met my stepdad, um, and he lived in Almaden Valley in Northern California. So after they were married, we moved up here, and I've lived in the Bay Area ever since. My mom did keep a detailed journal, and it's amazing to go through that journal, and she would talk about um, making a promise that she was going to offer a life of world culture, education, freedom, liberty. I take um, no credit for anything that I've ever achieved in my life. I think that I lived at this perfect nexus of my three parents. You had my mother, who was the ambitious, intelligent academic, um, came from a family of poets. You had my father, who was the consummate business tycoon in Iran, so I had that influence. And then my mom married my stepdad, who even though he was Iranian-American, he actually moved to the United States when he was 17 or 18. I view the world as if nothing is unattainable. I view the world as if change is inevitable. I view the world as an adaptation is required. And I think that's very Silicon Valley based. I'm not sure if I'd have all of those same philosophies had I grown up elsewhere in the United States. I don't even know how to explain it. I'm sure Iranian American is the proper term, but it makes it seem as if there are two parts of your identity that you're bridging. And that's not the case for me. It's so intertwined that I couldn't possibly separate it to say, well, these are the parts of me that are Iranian and these are the parts of me that are American. It's, it's who I am inside and out. It's the way that I think and dream in two languages. So I had an opportunity to go to Iran for two summers. Um, doing Stanford research. I had a translator while there. I got to meet with government officials, meet with students, um, you know, produce something that I was really proud of. I presented that research in May of 2004 to the Hoover Institution's um, conference on politics and democracy in a changing Iran. Um, I think it was featured in USA Today and published in a couple of places. And I thought, you know, here's, this is what I'm going to do in my life. You know, it's going to be toward academia and policy. I always assumed that I would run for office. It was all sort of coming together. When things were, of course, bound to change, and that's when I met two clinical psychologists um, who had started providing in-home care services in Palo Alto. I was drawn to it at first, not only because I think aging was something that all people have to face, and so I, I enjoyed the broad impact that a new product or service in aging could have, and I saw this as the beginning of something that could have you know, a national and potentially international impact. I think that the family and friends that I have in Iran are more intrigued by things that are not my primary profession. Um, you know, I'm on the board of the National Iranian American Council. They're certainly interested, especially now, in U.S.-Iran relations, and they know that our organization has really been at the forefront of those topics. So that's something they ask me a lot about. I think that NIAC has been sharing a message that was very unpopular for several years, and it's only now becoming popular. There was a time when it seemed unimaginable that we'd have the type of diplomatic um, conversations and, and at least relations that we're trying to explore right now. But that has always been, you know, NIAC's mission is that, um, you know, diplomacy should not be a dirty word. It should always be explored. Um, it's certainly better than, you know, military options. Other organizations, um, I was on the board of Parsa Community Foundation before it dissolved, also a wonderful organization that was bringing the community foundation model and a better understanding of strategic philanthropy to our community.
I've always been interested in creating that infrastructure within the United States. And Iranian Americans are involved in so many different things, you know, nonprofit work, media. Um, and I think that's the beginning of forming a sophisticated community is having that diversity. You know, I believe in the Dwight Eisenhower quote, politics ought to be the part time profession of every citizen. And I think that our community, after a long time of being politically apathetic, because in Iran, it didn't serve a family very well to necessarily be involved. That has come and backfired over many revolutions if you're involved in which side you're on. Here it's the opposite. It's only through involvement that you have a voice. And seeing that play out, not only in my generation, but even my parents' generation, that's been very uplifting and gives me a lot of hope about the future.